I read a fascinating book this past year entitled The Watchman's Rattle by Rebecca Costa. She looks at what leads to the collapse of strong civilizations. Among her most compelling chapters, she writes about the collapse of the Mayan Empire. For three and a half thousand years, the Mayans dominated much of Central America. They had water, infrastructure, a sophisticated calendar, weavers, farmers, architects. It was an astounding civilization. But then, for reasons hard to pinpoint, the civilization simply fell apart. Sometime between the middle of the 8th and 9th centuries, the majority of the Mayan people simply disappeared. Some say it was drought, food shortage, or some natural catastrophe. But Costa suggests that the Mayan civilization simply stopped addressing its challenges. The Mayan society had become so complex that it was far easier to ignore problems than to solve them. She writes that the process of collapse manifested itself first with gridlock, then irrationality, and then angry outbursts leading to violence and civil war. Sound familiar? We see the warning signs here now today. Are we on the brink of collapse? There's no way of knowing. But will we do as the Mayans did and ignore our challenges? Or will we address them? As Jews, or even as people connected and shaped by Jewish wisdom, address them we must. On Rosh Hashanah it is written, and on Yom Kippur it is sealed. How many shall pass away and how many shall be born? Who shall live and who shall die? Who in good time and who by an untimely death? Who by water and who by fire? Who by sword and who by wild beast? Who by famine and who by thirst? Who by earthquake and who by plague? Who shall become impoverished and who wealthy? These high holy days, as we utter the words of the Unatana Tokef over and over, I think of parents in Dayton, Ohio, who have spent the past months trying to explain to their elementary school children why neighbors will not be returning home or how friends are suddenly injured. Tonight, we send our thoughts and prayers to the victims' families in Dayton. These high holy days, as we pray together these words, I think of the approaching one-year mark since the Shabbat shooting at the Eitz Chaim Synagogue in Squirrel Hill, Pennsylvania. Tonight, we send our thoughts and prayers to the victims' families in Pittsburgh. These high holy days, as we pray together these words, I think of Mr. Alexander Roth, 66, who was born in post-war Germany in a small town northeast of Frankfurt. Mr. Roth served in the German Air Force and, as a young sergeant, was stationed at Fort Bliss in El Paso. One evening at a discotheque across the border, he met the woman he would marry, Rosa Maria Valdez. The couple had three children, one of whom described her father as soft-hearted and gentle, a lover of literature. He often spoke of the Holocaust, she said, and warned that if hatred and anger continue to be so intense, history is bound to repeat itself. In a recent interview, his daughter said, and isn't it ironic, that he was actually killed with such hatred and anger several weeks ago while shopping with the love of his life at Walmart. Tonight, we send our thoughts and prayers to Mr. Roth's family and know that his memory is a blessing. 
Following the San Bernardino shootings, then President Obama said, my thoughts and prayers are with the families of the victims in San Bernardino. President Trump sent thoughts and prayers to all of those affected by the shooting at the synagogue in Poway, California. And Vice President Pence tweeted, our thoughts and prayers are with the victims, courageous first responders, and all the people of El Paso. Now I must confess, and if you have not guessed yet, I have a complicated relationship with sending thoughts and prayers. Exactly what does this mean? The phrase thoughts and prayers has become our all too familiar refrain after each mass shooting, echoed in social media and informal statements that are offered by way of condolences to families and communities shaken by tragedy. But recently, this phrase seems somewhat cliche. These words are beginning to feel empty. We have the power to do more than send thoughts and prayers. We can choose to get involved, to make ourselves seen and heard, to truly support our American neighbors, our fellow human beings, families, friends, teachers, first responders, communities. For just as the spirit of these high holy days and our self-improvement through Teshuvah do not imply passivity or reactivity, Judaism teaches that there must be something beyond, behind our words, between our words. That being a bystander is an abomination in our tradition. The teshuvah of these days is not passive either. Our activity during these days is multidimensional and dynamic. It is a human attempt, a Jewish attempt, at self-transformation. Teshuvah is given to us so that we can change our own destiny. Teshuvah offers us the opportunity to realign ourselves and give our loved ones, and most importantly, ourselves, second chances. Teshuvah is not for bystanders. It's for upstanders. We know that Teshuvah in Hebrew is often translated as atonement in English. But in Hebrew, the word conveys the idea of returning. Return to what or whom? Some say return to God. Others say return to one another. But Teshuvah is nothing less than a return to our most authentic selves. It is like when Microsoft Word asks us if we want to return to an earlier version of a document. <laughs> Teshuvah calls us to return to the best iterations of ourselves. The great Talmudic scholar, Idin Steinsaltz, writes that about the transformative quality of Teshuvah. The goal of Teshuvah is far-reaching, he says. It should cast our faults as seeds of virtue. It is that which enables us to rebuild our personality and our past. In this way, we can see our faults as harboring creative potential for the beginning of a new and beautiful story. What new and beautiful story will we write this year? Sending thoughts and prayers is a starting point, but my friends, it is not enough. Now don't get me wrong, I am not suggesting that we stop praying, that we shouldn't send thoughts and prayers to those in our world who suffer. I believe in the power of prayer. I have seen how prayer can ease one's mind and help heal the body. We have seen how thoughts and prayers, when sent with the right intentions, can be, the, be a balm to those who mourn. And when we send thoughts and prayers from the heart, we benefit too. But we know how easy it is to feel powerless in the face of even the sincerest words and well wishes especially when innocent lives are lost forever due to senseless violence and mass shootings. As we mourn the lives lost this past year in places like El Paso and Dayton and every other community where gun violence is an everyday reality, it can seem impossible to find hopeful words of prayer. And for Judaism, powerlessness 
and brokenness are also the first steps of teshuvah, the beginning of restoration, transformation, and hope. During the height of the civil rights era, when African Americans were overcome with feelings of powerlessness, when a better life was unimaginable, and when hope was elusive. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King led a march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama. Last year, our high school juniors and seniors walked the same ground of that march and heard a firsthand account. They learned about one of the people who participated in that march, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. When Rabbi Heschel returned from Selma, he was asked by someone, did you find much time to pray when you were in Selma? Rabbi Heschel responded, I prayed with my feet. What was his point? That his marching, his protesting, his speaking out for civil rights was his greatest prayer of all. He sent thoughts and prayers in the form of himself. Prayer is action. Prayer changes us, charges us, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Prayer changes us in ways that invites, beckons, pulls us, compels us to act with justice and righteousness. Now there is a strange law from the book of Deuteronomy. It says that if someone is found murdered outside a town, the elders of the nearest town have to undergo a penitential ritual and say a prayer for forgiveness that contains the specific words, our hands did not shed this blood. It's strange because no one was accusing them of murder, but what the Bible is asking here is, have we done anything to contribute to an environment in which such a crime could happen? Did we give the victims shelter? Did we protect them? Did we do all we could to make sure the roads were safe at night? We weren't legally responsible for this death, but we were in some larger sense morally responsible. Can we really say our hands did not shed this blood? As the prophet Isaiah warns, though you pray at length, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Thoughts and prayers are necessary, but never sufficient. Days before the Parkland High School shooting, the Dalai Lama tweeted, although I am a Buddhist monk, I am skeptical that sending thoughts and prayers alone will achieve world peace. We need instead to be enthusiastic and self-confident in taking action. In the Reformed Jewish liberal tradition, it is not enough to think, hope, pray, and move on. Though these are more than tempting and alluded to throughout our High Holy Day liturgy, our work here affirms a common theme that we have felt for centuries as a people. It is time to send thoughts and prayers and it is time to take action. So I ask you, in the coming months, to join me and push our representatives in Congress to keep guns out of the hands of those who may commit violent acts. A Pew study states that solid majorities of both gun owners and non-owners favor limiting access to guns for people with mental illnesses. If you are a member of the NRA, and you agree with the Pew study results, then advocate for common sense restrictions that certain people with a propensity to be dangerous should not be able to purchase a firearm. Second, persuade our representatives in Congress to fund research into reducing gun violence. Some years ago, Congress took funding away from research as to how to reduce gun violence. The Dickey Amendment passed in 1996 mandates that none of the funds made available for injury prevention and control may be used to advocate or promote gun control. This was a colossal mistake. 
By supporting and funding sound research, we can have intelligent policy that will reduce the amount of gun violence in our country. Third, lobby our representatives in Congress to look for common ground where possible. Reducing gun violence doesn't have to be all or nothing. I recently read about the group Do Not Stand Idly By. They want manufacturers of guns to make them safer through the smart gun technology. Apparently, they can make guns where only the registered owner can shoot them. Just think of how many lives could be saved if a friend, nephew, or grandson took a family member's gun but couldn't shoot it. And finally, demand that our representatives in Congress consider training for anyone who wants to purchase a firearm similar to what we have our teens do right now through the DMV. A person should be required to pass a simple test about the dangers and responsibilities of owning a firearm and demonstrate they know how to lock it up and how to shoot it. We shouldn't be allowing people without training or understanding to own guns. This is, the safety, this is for the safety of them, but also, more importantly, for everyone else. At the beginning of August, Toni Morrison took her last breath. Maybe her writing did not move you as it did so many of us, though it seems hard to imagine. As an admirer recently wrote, Toni Morrison comprehended that being nice is not the same as being good. She wrote about what it's like to be hated, hated for things over which we have no control. She celebrated laughter and humor a way of taking the reins in one's own hands. She could be ruthless in her rendering of the truth, but never, ever was she hopeless. For all the unspeakably unnecessary slaughter of the day, of her day and now of our own, her voice did not ring out again and again. Get up, start over, rebuild, Recreate, transform, have hope. Tomorrow is another day. Kenya Hiratson, may this be God's will.